we are returning to the Gospel of Mark. We've had this as a, a, a section that we're looking at in sermons throughout the year. We had a few weeks where we, we took a look at some other sections, so now we're back to Mark. This is a section that it wasn't one of the appointed Bible readings, but I chose it to fit with the other two readings from our, our service. And, and I also chose it because in verse 15, I think there's a very powerful and important topic for us to, t- to talk about and to, to soak in the truth from God's Word that's presented here. So we'll especially focus on verse 15 and kind of return to the whole picture at the end of the sermon encouragement. Ephesians, well, not Ephesians, Mark, I'm looking at the wrong section, Mark 8, verses 11 to 15. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. I'm going to return to that phrase at the end, okay? Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. This is the word of our God. It it sounds like something so harmless. It's such a, a little thing, really. To compare something to yeast. What can be so dangerous about anything that's that's likened to to yeast? But Jesus obviously takes this very seriously, and he, he warns in verse 15: watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. In the original language, the words Jesus uses convey an urgency. Look out! I'm saying keep a a constant watch for this. Examine carefully everything that you're seeing and you're hearing so that you can stay away from. And then he mentions specifically the yeast. The yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Why? Jesus wants to point out to us today the the depth of danger, specifically behind two types of, two categories of, of temptation. Number one, looks can be deceiving, and we can be easily misled. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, they, you know, Pharisee has a, a negative connotation today. The Pharisees in Jesus' day would have been model citizens. You, you have to picture people looking up to them. You can picture people saying, they do such great things. Isn't there a part of us that and incessantly wants to receive the same type of attention from people? The same kind of of words of of praise? Isn't there a part of us that that begs us to think more highly of ourselves than we we ought? And and to think that there's just some goodness that comes naturally from us that people ought to, to praise us for? And maybe even God should praise us for Jesus warns us, watch out. And then on the other hand, you have you have Herod. Herod, Herod, in the Bible we get the picture, he, he did whatever he wanted. Now, the Herod that Jesus is talking about in this case is Herod Antipas. He was ruler in Galilee at this time during Jesus' ministry. Of course, he was underneath, he was given authority by the, the Roman government who was over him, but he was in a a prominent position, so so what kind of influence did he he show people? Well, he lusted after his brother's wife, 
he, he wooed her and convinced her to come along with him and to abandon her marriage and to move in with him and, and live together with him, bringing her, her daughter along with her. Oh, a, a couple of pages earlier in the Gospel of Mark, we also hear, hear about Herod that he, he liked to listen to the prophet of the Lord, John, John the baptizer. He liked to hear what John had to say. But he didn't like how John told him how it was when he, it came to his adulterous affair. That it was sin. And in the end, Herod, he killed John. At the request coming from his living girlfriend and her daughter. We, today, live in a society where someone might, might pick Herod as the poster boy. We live in a society that is very self-centered. Do we ever pick up that mindset? Or do we ever give the okay, our approval, to those who follow that way of thinking? Jesus warns us, watch out! If you think the challenges that we face to our faith in our day are not great, then you are greatly misled. Jesus' words apply to our day. So, let's take a closer look at the warning that Jesus gives. First, the first warning, the yeast of the Pharisees. I think we have to be super clear about this. There is a lot in our day that is religious that is not good. In fact, it is downright harmful. And sadly, many attempt, attach the name God, or even the name Christian, to their false teachings. But they are not from God. In fact, they stand opposed to God. And what I just described there, it fits the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were what people would view as good churchgoers. They were very religious. They even called out the right name for God. They viewed themselves as the Lord's people. But sometimes people have a mistaken impression about themselves. And the Lord has a different judgment about the Pharisees. He says, They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. So, though they, they call out my name, they don't really worship me at all. Why? What does it boil down to, the Pharisees' belief? We're told over in the Gospel of Luke. They place their confidence in their own righteousness. They trusted in themselves to be right with God. And so we hear the verdict in different places. They were on a path toward hell. And they were leading others who were following them down the very same doomed path. Examine carefully everything that you see and everything that you hear so that you can stay away from such yeast of today. And, and make no mistake, the same type of yeast is present in our day. And yes, it is often accompanied with the claim that it's from God, or that it's found in God's Word. Now, I'm not going to try to exhaust the examples. There are many. And, and sometimes they're, they're easier, sometimes they're harder to pick out amidst things that people are, are saying and teaching. I'll share just one, one sample. It's, a, it's from a book that claims to be teaching the Christian faith, and yet it says, moved by the Holy Spirit, we can merit for ourselves and others all the graces needed to attain eternal life. Put that in simpler words. It's saying, we can do what's needed to earn our way into God's presence eternally. Of course, everywhere the Bible refutes that. In Titus we hear God saved us. Not because of the righteousness righteous things we have done, he saved us because of his mercy, his 
undeserved love to us in Christ, or the often spoken passage from Ephesians 2, it's by grace you're saved. So it's not by your works, it's, it's a gift from God. It's from His undeserved love to you. It's through faith in Jesus Christ so that no one can boast. And, and here's why this is such a, a the, the teaching, the false teaching on the previous slide, why it's such a, a dangerous thing. In Galatians we're told, you who are trying to be declared right with God by obeying laws, by your own actions, in reality you have alienated yourself from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. <clears throat> Jesus warns us about a, a second great assault against our faith. In Mark 8, verse 15. It too has the potential to blind us and blind others to the need for our Savior. He highlights the threat when he says, the yeast of Herod. Now, we talked about earlier that Herod did, essentially, it seems, and you get the picture, he did whatever he wanted. He did what he wanted in spite of hearing what God's Word had to say. And that's our key thing we're looking at. What are examples of that same pattern today? came across an email that was on a, a Christian website sent into them. I'm leaving my husband and our two small children. I know what the Bible says. In other words, I, I know the Bible says this is wrong. But God knows my heart. He just wants me to be happy. <coughs> or, I don't remember the exact quote from this one. It was a while ago. But there was a blog where a young lady posted how she decided to move in with her, her boyfriend and, of course, sleep together before marriage. And she said she had prayed about this and she felt that God was telling her it was okay. Well, she's not alone. I found a, a survey done of, a, I think it was a couple thousand individuals on a Christian dating site. And out of those people, the, the view on sex before marriage was, you can add those up there, only 11% said, said, no, God's word is clear, that's not something for before marriage. These are just a couple of examples of a larger pattern. And in these examples, what do we see? Like the example with Herod. People have God's word. These people have the Bible. And to some degree, they like to, to listen to it. Herod liked to listen to John. But they are refusing to listen when God calls them to admit their sin and to turn from their sin. And sometimes they're even, they're even using God and saying that He approves. God just wants me to be happy. God never says that about sin. He always says, I want you to repent. I want you to turn away from sin. I want you to turn to me for forgiveness, for I long to show you my mercy. Don't deny your sin. Remain in your sin and turn away in rejection of me and in unbelief. Examine carefully everything that you're seeing and hearing so that you can keep away from the yeast that is present in our day. I put this in quotes. False teaching in any shape, size, or form is extremely dangerous. I pulled that from our adult Bible information class as we do Bible study. In this lesson, when we come to this topic, I think it's really, I think I've observed it's eye-opening for many people to see how strongly God speaks on this topic. Someone might say, but aren't there, aren't there some false teachings that aren't such a big deal? Aren't there some teachings that just get a little off from what the Bible says? And, and maybe it's no big deal if we, if we ignore some of, of those. Well, remember what Jesus, in our verse from Mark, likens, likens false teaching to. Yeast. 
Now there's a point behind him choosing that as the illustration. What does that teach us about the danger of false teaching? Yeast is, is very small, but it has a huge effect. False teaching in any shape, size, or form is extremely dangerous. We, we see over in, in the book of 2 Peter, false teaching being described, false teachers bringing that teaching in, and the, the description attached to the false teaching is destructive. So think that through. Like, like poison does harm to a person's body, false teaching does harm to a person's faith. And so, how would you feel if it was your body and someone said, how about a little anthrax to take? And if it were some other form of poison, would you ever think, oh, it's just a, a little bit, so I guess it's no big deal. No. And here's one more example that, that God's Word uses. Their teaching, speaking of some false teaching, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Well, how's a little gangrene sound to you? you? You know what happens if you don't if you don't get rid of if you ignore gangrene, right? It continues to affect everything that it infects until it's all killed off. And so the conclusion that this passage in Second Timothy comes to that the result from the false teaching was they destroy the faith of some. So essentially, our Lord is warning us, watch out for even little doses of false teaching. A little can have a huge effect. It can even be deadly to your faith. Still the question might be raised, if people were asked for the top ten most deadly things to stay away from in the world, how many people would include false teaching on their list? Our God obviously does. The truth of God is, every false teaching is damaging to our faith. We take it in. And every false teaching is potentially deadly. It is potentially faith destroyed. Now, this is why we've taken so much time here this morning to talk about the, this topic. It, it, and it's just verse 15 we've really looked at. In the Greek, that's just 15 words from Jesus. But Jesus' words are weighty. And Jesus' words carry urgency. They bring clarity. When we see their meaning, we, and we know the one who loves us so much to share it with us, we have a fire in us to then keep away from, to look for and keep away from the yeast of false teachings that we identify. We treasure the truth of God that we have. We treasure our Savior Jesus. Take a glance back. And as you glance back over our, our whole section, what do you see? Everywhere in the record of Jesus' life, there is one thing that unites all of it. I say one thing, but it's not so easy to put in just one word. Deep care. Uh, uh, uh. An unlimited concern. An undying love for every soul he encountered. He cared for his disciples. He cared so much for his disciples here that we see he would not leave false teaching unaddressed. He pointed out to the disciples the presence of false teaching and the danger of false teaching so that they could stay away from it. He does the same for us today. He also had a profound concern for the Pharisees. At the opening of verse 12, Mark helps us to see Jesus' emotion. 
we're told. He sighed deeply. Jesus could see their duplicity. He knew that their question was asked with an evil intent to test him or to tempt him. And, and you can hear in Mark's description the pain that he's writhing with inside when they ask this. Not pain for himself, but pain felt for them. He knew that they were still chained up in their sin and their unbelief and the rejection of Him, the only Savior, and He wanted to free them. We're told He left them, but not before He gave them a final word of direction. Now here, in verse 12, the literal translation would, would go like this. And sighing deeply in His spirit, He said, why is this generation seeking a sign? Truly, I say to you, if a sign will be given to this generation, dot, dot, dot. Now what does that mean? Mark records Jesus' words hanging there. If a sign be given to this generation, dot, dot, dot. <coughs> and... I think most people hearing the English translation that we have in front of us would, would maybe take away the wrong meaning. It really means, if a sign would be given to this generation, it'll be one different than what you're looking for. Different than, than what you're asking of me. He pointed them to look for a sign different than the way their hearts were turned. And then over in Matthew, in chapter 16, this is recorded, which match, per, matches perfectly with that. They will receive the sign of Jonah. What's that? You know your Bible history, and you recall, Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days. Jesus would be in the belly of the earth for three days, and on the third day after his crucifixion, he would rise from the dead. Jesus pointed them to God's rescue for sinners, to his death to take away our sins, and his resurrection to show us that the victory is won. Here's the news of how deep our God loves each one of us. He was delivered over to death for our sins. He was raised to life for our justification, meaning to declare us not guilty. And everyone who believes in Jesus has his righteousness, his holiness credited to us. We who are gathered here today, we don't ignore our sin. We admit our, our many sins. We admit our daily sin. The times we fall into pride and the times we fall into to such selfishness that, that we do whatever we want. And the comfort that our God brings us today is everyone who believes in Him, Jesus, has forgiveness of all their sins. Continue to live in Him. Rooted and built up in Him. Strengthened in your faith in Him. And overflowing with thanksgiving to God. Amen.